Okay, well, uh, thanks again, everyone, for coming. Now I'm going to hand over to Ben. So Ben is one of Restart's longest standing volunteers. He's been with us for almost 10 years at this point, which is about the same length that Restart's been going. Um, and has attended many, many repair events over the years and fixed many, many devices. Um, ben got his start in repair by building guitars as his first job uh, and having to deal with all the electronics uh, inside the guitar. Since then, he's graduated as an electronic engineer. Got it right this time. It's not electrical, electronic. I made that mistake too often. Uh, and is now a software developer working on smart TV apps in particular. Um, but Ben has a deep interest and background in audio equipment, um, as well as a couple of other people in the, in the session um, that I can see. Uh, and he's here tonight to talk to us about three, three main elements. So the first one is how to get the most from old MP3 players, such as iPods, um, by kind of upcycling them or giving them a new lease of life with new features. The second is going to be a broad overview of some of the principles when working with audio equipment, particularly around how to use audio signals and how to make things connect. Um, and then the third will be um, a more in-depth look at how to turn an old set of speakers um, into a kind of a smart set of speakers or to enhance the functionality uh, of older, older speakers such as that. Then we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me hand over to Ben. Ben, take it away. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, so uh, obviously fixing guitars means music. I was always uh, into music first, um, always had lots of sound systems around, um, and it's probably one of the easiest ways to um, to tinker and get into repair, I found. So um, it will be nice in the next hour to talk about the way it's kind of universal. Um, audio equipment tends to be really easy to interconnect. And so if you've got something old, you can usually get it working either by fixing something or adding something or, or getting something new. So uh, I'll go over that uh, with a few different areas as James has, has outlined. Um, we've, we've got an hour, so uh, it'll probably be quite a whistle stop. I'll keep moving. So just uh, throw questions up as you go or drop them in chat and I'll try and answer as we go so I don't ramble too much. Um, but uh, yeah, enough intros. I think I'll start with something maybe in the spirit more geeky than repair, but uh, it's pretty handy. So I'll talk about the, um, the various things you can do for an iPod as an example, but you can do it for lots of different MP3 players. So um, there were three things that we worked on uh, a few years ago for um, uh, an, an art festival, Biennale for Restart. So we took an iPod, I think it was you know, pre-classic when it was just called an iPod, uh, and basically the battery had worn out. Um, maybe it had a corrupted system, but it, it was not useful at all. It wasn't functional. Uh, and also obviously capacity has gone down. So we found out there are different things people are doing and obviously writing guides, which is what the internet is great for, is someone has documented it and will share um, that you can um, replace the battery, obviously, um, but you can also upgrade the storage from being a tiny hard drive, which is fragile and small and actually uses lots of energy uh, to SD cards or even a solid state disk, which means you can increase your capacity and make it more lightweight and all these kind of just cool improvements. Um, and then the other thing that you can do is also um, upgrade the firmware or the software in the device so that it's got new features or nicer features than were original given that for instance apple won't have updated the software on an old ipod for you know some of them will be 10 years out of out of expiry now so um i'm actually going to jump to the web page that we wrote which again is quite brief and just show you how straightforward the process can be um so i'm going to try and work out screen sharing i'm not mega familiar with zoom but I think if I were to jump to browser there. Now, is that sharing a web page? Yep, that looks good. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, 2017. There we go. Um, so, it's National Upcycling Week. I think we published this um, and we covered it in you know, a, a typical kind of a news article way where we did the process, we put it on display. And then we, we just nodded to the, the references we had because there are other guides doing all this. Someone somewhere figured it out. Um, 
so the storage uh, is, is pretty cool because people are manufacturing PCBs. So I'll briefly jump into that one if I can find the correct window. Here we go, jump to the top because I've been reading it. Um, this is a, what they call a no solder process. So you do have to open your iPod. You do have to disconnect a few fragile wires and change some parts. And there's a component that you need to purchase, but it's not micro soldering. It's not something you're going to really struggle with if you've got your typical amount of repair experience on anything like laptops, for instance, or phones. Um, so I'm just trying to find the actual product. So here, I don't know how clear that picture is, but effectively, it's more or less the kind of space that's left in the iPod after the motherboard and the battery. And it allows you to put in this green PCB on top is a solid state disc. And that lets you uh, upgrade the size. Um, but yeah, there's that nice byproduct of lower power consumption. And uh, there are other people making similar products, which actually lets you use an SD card. So you can put in, I think, I think four micro SD cards will fit in an iPod. Um, so we did that and we went up to something like 128 gig, which is, is a whole bunch of music. I mean, if you've only got music, that's um, a big collection. Um, but you can swap SD cards or you can have backups um, or still video. So that's really cool. Um, and I, I won't go into too much detail on the actual process because ultimately we use someone's guide and you can use the same guide and you may have a different device. So we're really talking about what's possible rather than how to in this sense. Um, but what's really great is that uh, people are doing this not just for iPods, but for your classic Zoom or you might have a, a Sony Walkman MP3 player. Um, and I'll, I'll talk briefly about the different things that people have done for the operating system soon. Um, batteries, again, well, that's the SSD. Uh, here's your layout. So um, the SSD takes up, you know, a large portion. And then uh, the battery here is, again, it's just a wire that you disconnect and swap out. So the main challenge is finding the right component, which uh, if you use eBay or Amazon or any of the, the big sellers, you'll find these things readily available. Someone tends to have labeled it correctly and you can get it. So it's not a challenge once you're in there. It's, you know, almost once you commit to one upgrade, you may as well upgrade several parts. Uh, and new, a new battery will give you a, a new lease of life, you know. Um, if you, again, if you've done any repair at this scale of laptops, phones, um, toys even, it's not difficult to do. It's not going to be a barrier to stop you doing it to your own device, even if you're not that competent with repair yet, if you're still learning. Um, these processes actually are cool because you don't need to do anything to the system. So basically you, you power down the iPod, when you power it back up, you end up with uh, upgraded battery and new storage. I think you might have to do a factory reset so you format the iPod. Um, so that's super easy. Uh, you know, uh, no soldering, no special tools needed. Everything's purchasable online. Um, and actually, you know, it, they, people pitch this as using your, your classic device that you love, but you can go shopping for old stuff people are selling cheap because they think it's, it's out of date. Um, most of my equipment is stuff I bought because people thought it was either broken or old. And, and it's not, it's great. So um, you can go shopping for your dream device and build it yourself and save some waste. Um, so that, yeah, that covers the storage and the battery. Um, the operating system, the firmware is actually really interesting because uh, I just need to find the tab one off. You've got Zoom UI over my screen. Um, basically, people who reverse engineer stuff uh, have been doing it for not just iPods, but there's one popular one called a Rockbox, which is a new firmware. Um, and it's running on Apple iPod, kind of all the way up to the iPod Touch. Uh, Arcos, if anyone remembers Arcos, they were really fancy MP3 players and home entertainment controllers. Uh, Creative, my first MP3 was from Creative. Uh, iRiver were popular. Um, I'm trying to think which ones I remember. Samsung, I had a couple. SanDisk. Uh, and there's also work in progress. There's lots of unstable ports, as they call them. So this is one of those nice things about the open source community where uh, anyone can progress it. And once it's out there, it's out there for everybody. So um, I would recommend you do a bit of research for your particular device, uh, see what it offers. I know that as a... Milestone, a way of example, some of these devices now connect to Spotify. So if you like the modern streaming services, you can effectively add it into your existing device. Um, 
which is super because then you've got your classic music player, the, probably the quality of the audio chip would have been better, but you've also got access to them, the whole world of music. Um, but yeah, all I can really do is nod to other people's guides because that's all we did. It's a, a bit of searching, find the guide for your device and follow it. That's for disassembly, for parts. Um, but that's, that's a really cool one without needing to get too kind of hands-on, no soldering, no wire cutting. Uh, and then kind of, yeah, just uh, do it, go as far as you want to. I mean, you might not need to upgrade your storage or you might love the idea of every song you've ever listened to in your pocket, which was the original pitch of the iPod, you know, a thousand songs in your pocket. Um, so those are really cool. Um, and it, it went down really well because especially the iPod is an iconic thing. So if you, you know, we put it on a, on a plinth and said, look, this is, it will never die. And, uh, and it's true, you can have that forever um, until you sit on it and break the screen or some other thing, that, the horrible demise of, of your love devices. Um, so that, will might, that might pique your interest in playing with older audio stuff because it gets you as far as the headphones. You know, you, you, you'll be carrying that in your pocket like you always have with your favorite headphones or you might have it at home plugged into an amp. So that's the next thing I'll talk about is the, the analog side, the audio side, because this is where it gets really, really universal. Um, you, uh, you kind of don't need to know all that much because audio is quite straightforward. It, you don't have any issues between brands. You don't have issues between kind of like types of equipment. It's more or less straightforward. Um, I'll drop in and check chat if I can find the button so that I can see if there are any questions or James, you can yell at me. Um, no questions yet. No, feel free to keep going. But if anyone does have questions, feel free to add it into the chat whenever they come up and we can start and answer them. Thank you, I should have brought two screens up, it helped. Um, yeah, so I can leave the screen to share up briefly actually. Uh, no, I won't. Uh, I should, there we go, red button. I don't know how I work in software and, uh, and still don't know how to work things like this. Um, so as far as it goes with audio gear, um, the headphone port in your phone or your mp3 player or for that fact if you have a home amplifier or there's probably one on the back of your tv they all work to a pretty similar level which is the principle is generally stereo so you have two channels of audio like you'd have two speakers two headphones um sometimes more but a headphone socket can be quite relied on to have two channels um and it's at a low level so you can't plug that straight into speakers because there's no power you can't produce you know loud sound there's no amplification um, however you can plug into some things will only really drive other other systems so like if you had a separate system with a cd player it couldn't drive headphones but you'd go into an amplifier but typically these low levels are a little bit connectable together so the output on your phone that is for headphones can happily go into an amplifier so there's basically the concept of what you might call low level or line level or signal level audio and all you need to do is get it amplified, which is a single step, effectively. Um, and you then can run it to speakers. Uh, so it, if you're not afraid to snip your wires and attach them to the right connector, almost anything audio will connect to the next thing in the chain. Um, so I'll kind of give you an example of my setup here and, and show you the typical kind of stuff. So if we start at, now that's turned on, so I won't use that. I will use that uh, Raspberry Pi. Just need to think of what we'll see in a moment. A Raspberry Pi, which is a small computer and it's got an audio output, but it's also got uh, internet connectivity and you know lots and lots of support. So this is hopefully a fairly familiar connector if I can get some focus on my camera. That's a headphone port or a 3.5 millimeter audio connector, stereo. Um, you would have the opposite end of that plug, it looks like this which is again, hopefully quite familiar. I wonder where I'll get some focus. Um, and these, you can buy them. It doesn't have to be on headphones. It can be something you just, you know, get and connect up. And then at the other end, there's a kind of a range uh, of connector styles, but the most common is probably the RCA or phono or coaxial type connectors. So the thing to note about this is that you've got a pin in the middle, which is effectively your signal and a ring on the outside that's your ground. And you may notice there are two. That's your left and right channel. So the tiny connector has been bridged out from being left and right into being two separate plugs. They will go into your amplifier 
So here's what's really great these days is you can get tiny amplifiers with enough power for a, a living room or you know a room for five, 10, 20 quid that are perfectly good enough to enjoy. You might want to spend more and get beautiful sound quality, but in terms of projects, you know, you can throw the setup I'm showing you here together for 10, 20 quid on top of the, the bits you might already have around, which might be everything. So I'll try and always pair up the connector. So now you've got the phono connector or the RCAs, which go into this red and white connector, which again, hopefully is familiar. You would have seen this on the back of a stereo or on the side of your TV or similar. And these carry low level signal. This is the point at which low level will become high level. So amplifier, it amplifies signals. They go from, you know, a low range with no power to being able to drive current. And so on the front is the familiar power switch and just a volume control. That's all this does is amplifies. And then speaker terminals. So uh, at this point, there's a connector style change. So you don't accidentally connect low level to high level. So typically, speakers will have speaker wire or speaker connectors and in a moment i'll show you some more examples but what we're working with today i'm just going to twist these up because they're a bit afraid is plain wire is that so that's copper wire it's got two conductors they don't need to be coaxial where there's a center and an outside now because it's actually more both sides of a of a power supply rather than a zero volts and a, and a voltage or something like that so at this point you've got Plain wire, which means you can connect it to anything. You can solder it, you can put a plug on it, you can put it in the screw terminals on here. So effectively with these, you, and I might as well do it. You, there's a hole in the center of the connector and I'm gonna put that in there like that and then tighten this up. I've only had a third hand. And it's like a little clamp and it grabs the wire. So, these are sort of the most common things. You'll see them everywhere you go. And if you don't see them, there'll be something similar, which we can talk about, which you can then uh, get things connected up with. Um, if you are using any older equipment, like uh, old amplifiers, separate systems, you're especially likely to see this kind of stuff, um, which means, you know, kind of if, you, if you've worked with it on your own equipment at home, you're more likely to know how it works. While I'm chatting, I might bring up some slides. Uh, and that way I can put the other connector on while I show you. So you can need to find some extra keys. So here is typical connectors for uh, low level signals, i.e. something coming out of your phone or out of a, a headphone plug on a device. And on the top row, I've got the stereo style headphone connectors. Uh, and then in the middle row, there's the sort of phono or coax type stuff, uh, which you typically be finding towards the amp side, but sometimes you get them as the output as well uh, on something. And then along the bottom is just a close up of what coaxial cable looks like. So you have the shield on the outside and the signal conductor straight down the middle carrying the actual sort of signals. Um, so that cable to work with that, you effectively strip off the outside plastic, push back the sheath, and then expose the middle conductor. And you can solder them or you can get screw terminals or you might find they come with connectors. Um, and that's as technical as it's, as it's gonna get really, because if you can get your stuff connected up like that, it will work. Um, any level mismatching that you might find, for instance, if you're overloading the amp because your signal's too much, you've typically got a volume control on your device, whether that's a phone or an iPod or we'll be having a Raspberry Pi, you can turn the volume up or down if it's, too high or too low, and then the amplifier will have a master volume. So there's no there's no big fear of, you know, it will have the wrong protocol or it won't have the right Wi-Fi version. It just kind of works. Um, so I've got those connected up. I think I've stopped screen sharing now, so I'll show you in a moment. Uh, so speaker cable on the top is an example. Sometimes it comes with two wires inside one sleeve. Sometimes it will come as a pair like I've got. Sometimes it comes with connectors fitted. And all these pictures on the bottom row are the backs of speakers. Um, on the left are screw down terminals with a uh, high and low frequency effectively. Um, they're bridged together. In the middle, there's the sprung ones you often see, especially on sort of lower budget stuff where you have to pull the spring down, push the wire in and it grabs it. 
Um, and that's it. It's, if it's a firm grab, it's connected. Uh, and so, yeah, I've got these both channels connected. That's basically two speakers have a pair of wires each. I just need to plug in the power and plug in the signal and we'll kind of uh, move forward a little bit. Um, just by way of kind of uh, demonstrating how much this system was thrown together. I'll show you the other bits. So the speakers I did pay for because I wanted something small but good quality. So it's about my fifth pair of speakers trying to find the perfect thing to fit my desk. But mostly they've been secondhand. In fact, they've always been secondhand. But the rest of the system, the amplifier I already have from the project and the power supply. I don't know how visible this is. I'm doing so I can't put it too far. It's a universal laptop power supply. So the amp can handle Let's take a look what it says. It says DC in, it doesn't say a voltage, but it can run anywhere from five volts to 24 usually. Um, and basically if you supply a higher voltage, it can go louder eventually, if you choose to turn it up. So um, I've got a big box of laptop power supplies because I fix things. Um, I think a lot of us probably have that kind of stuff. Um, you know, most people who don't like throwing things away probably have kept a laptop power supply when the laptop died. So all I had to do was cut off the connector from the one that matched a whichever make of laptop and solder on the right plug for my amp, which is again, like quite a universal size. Um, and there we have, you know, an amplifier with a power supply that was effectively free. So that's two steps. I can leave that there for a moment. And um, that's kind of, that's kind of as far as audio needs to go. So all you need is a source and either something to amplify it or you often get speakers to amplify themselves. So, you know, they've just got an audio in. So uh, modern stuff is very often self-amplifying, but you'll know because it will have the right connector on the back. It will have a headphone plug. So you'll know that all you need is a, a headphone to headphone connector rather than any adapters. Um, funny enough, I've got my radio here, which I will use as a radio. But it's got an orgs in it. It's often called orgs in, and it looks like a headphone port. So if I wanted to, I could sit my Raspberry Pi on the radio and have an extra channel of playing whatever I wanted off the Pi. So it's it's super universal. You might already have something in your house you want to add your device to. Um, so that's uh, that's what's really cool about it is if you already have the amp you like, or you have something you enjoy using, or you might have like a sound bar you know you can basically connect in by just getting either the right cable or the right adapter um it's just really really low cost in terms of how much skill you need and how much knowledge compared to for instance if you were trying to connect a certain kind of display like if you have an old screen that you really like but you don't have a computer that can drive it you might need expensive adapters or you might never get it working um audio is super super enjoyably simple um and you can kind of be creative uh you can also like if you've got something that's mostly broken, you can replace the bit that broke. So you might have a boom box that the speakers have blown. Well, you could just run its audio out to a pair of speakers, or you could have uh, a pair of speakers you've always liked, um, but your iPod has died or something similar at home. So you then just get yourself another device and connect it to them. Um, you know, you might have to open something up and remove a part. For instance, if you've got a big cabinet with an amplifier and speakers and the amplifier dies, you could go inside, take the speaker wires, just connect them to a new amplifier on top or inside if you want to drill a hole. And, you know, it's kind of, it, it's very, very straightforward. Um, so I can't demo this until uh, I've got a source of audio, which is the, the bit that I haven't done is a Raspberry Pi. So I'll kind of take that as my cue to shift to the last section to talk about. Um, much like how we talked about, in fact, I'll, I'll pause for any questions or any kind of uh, queries and have a look at chat. I actually had a, a quick question, which was, um, is it possible to kind of split an audio signal? So to send the audio from uh, like an input device to multiple outputs? Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's, you can, firstly, the rule of thumb is um, basically you can usually send an amplifier to multiple, low, or, you know, a source to multiple syncs, should we say. So if you've got an output and you want to send it to two pairs of speakers, it's usually safe because you're loading down the output, it has to work harder, but the speakers are all seeing a signal or the amplifiers are seeing a signal. So splitting audio as it goes out can work. And for instance, you can use it if you wanna have 
two people listening to one pair of headphones. But you can also use it if you want to go to four speakers in a room and you, you don't want to get one of the fancy amps that has a bunch of channels. You can just split it and it will work quite well. The rule of thumb is you don't usually join up um, two amplifiers outputs together. So if you're trying to plug two phones into one speaker, or more of a problem with amplifiers, if you're trying to drive a speaker from two amplifiers, the problem is the amplifiers want to drive current. They'll, you know, they want to kind of be delivering as much as the system will take. And so there's a risk that they'll try and push signal to each other. Um, I'm not getting too technical, but yeah, effectively, um, should we call it diluting signal? Is a lot safer than trying to add signals together um so yeah that is something you can do um you'll find a connector for 99p on your favorite online marketplace that will literally just turn one plug into two sockets and you're away um and there's a bunch of uses for that these little connectors are awesome because you can do all sorts of fun stuff um and have it you know get two or three connectors daisy chain them together bundle it up with a cable tie and put it behind your your computer or something and you've got a unique setup that you designed that does what you want um, and that's why I like doing this is it does what I want I don't have to go and buy a sound bar that has bluetooth built in and four-way sound I just cut a wire and split it to two amplifiers I already had or you know at this point in life I've hoarded enough bits of random audio gear that I can always find what I need and the only thing I'm lacking is quality speakers because you sort of do have to invest sometimes um, yes thanks Ben uh, we have a question from Leila who asks, what about fixing amps? Is that something you can cover? Yeah, I won't go into it today because um, it's broad and uh, it's obviously kind of, um, there. it's more on the electronic details side than the audio side, but it's obviously something that, you know, we do at Restart Parties, we uh, learn about as we go. Some people know lots, um, analog amplifiers. So, you know, older things are, uh, you know, often still work and are worth fixing because they are simple enough to keep working. They don't become obsolete, you know, in the way that computers and, and things like that do. So um, it's probably a subject in its own right, but, um, I, you know, I, I like to do it. I'm still learning. Um, I personally like valve amplifiers because I'm a guitar person. So I watch a whole load of YouTube um, for like basically watching people take stuff apart and fix it. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a shout out for FreeCycle which yeah, it's a great place for free kit because um, it's often bulky or people have bought something new that they prefer, um, uh, but also often when there's a failure, you can improve it, you can fix it. Um, audio stuff is so simple, especially speakers and cabinets that you can often get them working. Yeah, um, as I mentioned, I think I've never bought any new speakers in my life. I just, uh, I just shop around till I find cool stuff. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, in terms of audio sources, we've talked about phones and, and iPods and kind of um, things you probably already have around, um, but we're getting into a really cool time where um, tech is really available. So the Raspberry Pi actually came out in 2012, so 10 years old now, um, and it's relatively budget in that it came out at £30, which for a computer is pretty cool if you want to get a kid into computing or have a unique project in a corner that doesn't need a whole computer. But um, in reality, uh, kind of, that's also quite high budget for like a, a simple project sometimes in that you don't need to spend it. Um, so the Pi is great because it has an audio output. Uh, I don't know how much I can point to, but inside it's got a full on computer that can run an operating system. It can either have networking built in or I've got a Wi-Fi adapter. It's got USB so you can plug in a hard drive or any kind of, um, other equipment you need like a keyboard and mouse it's got a display out it's got networking um it's kind of overkill to play music in a way because um in, if you don't need a screen and if you don't need network connectivity then you don't need it so kind of uh there are now things you can get that just do the job you want so let's say you have uh, speakers you love they're 40 years old they're classic analog things you know like this made of wood and quality but you like to play music off your phone now so, you know, and you want to move around with your phone. I personally, if I plug my phone in for music, it stops being something I can pick up and look at. Um, you can get a Bluetooth board, which is, you know, even smaller. Um, that's kind of, uh, it might be maybe the size of, I don't know how we describe that, two inches square. Um, that's got a Bluetooth connector and an amp built in. So it's doing the job of the Bluetooth link and also the amp I've got here. 
and all you need is a power supply. And yeah, you have to solder six wires, right? You've got your two wires for your left channel and your right channel and your outputs to the speakers. Um, but it's small enough, you can stick it to the back of the speaker. You can put it in a box or you can double-sided tape it. Uh, and it just does one job, which is so awesome in terms of preventing waste is to buy something that isn't trying to do lots, doesn't cost a lot to produce, but does one job. So it will always do that job. Um, you can get Bluetooth ones, but you can also get ones that connect to Wi-Fi, which means they become like a streaming device. You know, when you're um, on your home network and things pop up like a TV or a smart speaker, if you have a Google Home or an Alexa, as available for basically, uh, what do they call it? Casting, right? You can cast music or stream it to these devices. Um, Bluetooth's nice because it's straightforward and simple. Doesn't rely on the internet or Wi-Fi. Guests can do it. It's quite robust. Um, most you know, phones have it. Um, but yeah, like the Wi-Fi ones are cool because guests to your home can use them without need to be shown or told. They can find them on the network. They have a name. Um, these boards range from sort of five quid to, I just had a quick look at the moment, and some of them were like 15, which would be the ones with an amplifier in. But again, you can get the ones that don't have an amplifier if you've already got an amplifier for your speakers. So those are really, really... Um, great for just doing you know if you want again want to solve a problem want to get something going um as a quick example before i move on just because i can see it over over my shoulder sort of thing um here's another five pound amp that it, it buying things cheap from china can be really risky because you might be buying something that's almost throwaway but uh what i do is i've worked with a lot of low voltage stuff for boats and uh cars and stuff like that so anything that will run on a boat 24 volt supply will run off of the laptop charger and this just does the exact same job of that amp of two speaker outs audio input and a aux port um and that will screw to the bottom of my desk for maybe five years um so you can always find kind of the exact thing you'll need uh i've got a question in the chat then yeah uh, from from leila who asks is it possible to do that with a pair of rock, rocket sixes um and also could you send a link to the uh, Wi-Fi Bluetooth box. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably find a few good examples of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth boards um, and compile it without leaning too much on Amazon. I'd rather find something that, yeah, makes more sense like a shop. Yeah, Rocket 6, I'm guessing studio monitors. So typically they're self-amplifying -amplif kind of high-end designs where they're tuned cabinets and they're designed to be self-contained. So you plug your computer or your mixing desk into them. Um, so probably you can just plug straight in the back. But if the amplifier in it has died, you can replace the amplifier board with one of these. Um, it's just a case of opening it up and finding the connections. Uh, and the cool thing about uh, rockets and all of those, so I think they're made by KRK. So although any, any brand that's popular will have more people on the internet taking it apart and fixing it and explaining it. That's one of the cool things about buying a, a branded product is people want to retain value by fixing it. Um, and you'll find more people selling parts and stuff. So. Definitely doable, Leila, absolutely. Um, whether the speakers are fully working or need to you know, have one part that's damaged, you'll be able to get it working with a single replacement. Um, so I will do a little demo on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, much like I talked about Rockbox, which is the firmware for various MP3 players. It's, it always, it's a project rather than a single firmware. It's a project for keeping these things alive. Uh, there are lots of projects for Raspberry Pi that are not necessarily for keeping things alive. They're more for um, encouraging, you know, audio file kind of music lovers to move into a new, a new era. So they often enable things like streaming, but they also do um, home music library kind of availability or high quality streaming. So I'm going to see if I've got a link to the website. It's not very interesting as a thing with Illumio. Um, also, they're a bit producty. They want to pitch themselves as a high end thing you buy, whereas I, I know that I can download it, use it for free. It's, it's relatively open source. Um, so let's see if I can go through the install process very quickly. Uh, I'm going to open a piece of software which lets you um, record to SD cards. So basically with a Raspberry Pi, um, it's not quite the same as a Windows or a Mac PC where you can boot it up and install an operating system. What you typically do is you choose what you want, which could be, Ubuntu, or it could be a specialized operating system. You can do home automation. In this case, we've got, I'm gonna use one called Volumio, 
which is the name of the kind of particular flavor of music player. And uh, I'm going to try and share. You take the software and you effectively write the um, write the downloaded image of this operating system to your SD card. So we've got a tiny black rectangle, not really useful, but that's an SD card or a micro SD that goes in the Pi. And effectively, I'm going to plug a different one into my PC so I don't overwrite it. Have I shared the screen yet? I have not. There's a bit of software called Rufus. And it just is a re does a really nice job. I'm for some reason I struggle to do this step of writing SD cards for Raspberry Pi. I always fail, and so I found the tool that works for me, and I will use it forever. Um, all you do is you select the correct disk, which I've got a four gig SD card. Um, you select the image as it's called, uh, which I've got Volumio version three dot three hundred one. It's got a date from hmm, three weeks ago. Pi dot zip. I open that. It sets everything else up itself, and then you just click start. Um, it will give you a warning about overwriting your SD card, and it should give you another warning, or it might not because I hadn't formatted that. This will take, I think it took four or five minutes earlier in the practice run, so I'm going to go to one I've done earlier because uh, it's not very important to watch a loading bar, is it? So I can stop sharing that. And uh, I just work from my camera as best I can. So, I've got a few bits that may or may not be very interesting. My Volumio setup had a screen because I wanted to have it like a classic piece of audio equipment where it's on a shelf between the speakers and you can touch it and see it and it's physical. So I've got a, a screen, it's really shiny so you won't see much, but it fits you know, under the, on, on top of the Raspberry Pi, connects to it, and I will briefly connect that up in a moment. Um, and then the other thing I have that's really awesome because I'm an, I like touch is um, an audio interface that has a volume control. So it's USB, it gives you a second headphone port for audio output that should be better quality. But the main thing is it's got a big free turning volume control. So I can, if I'm listening to really loud music, which is how I tend to listen to music, and the doorbell goes or my phone rings, you can grab it and turn it down. And it's, you don't have to get your phone out or say something to an assistant. You just touch it. And I really value this. Um, and again, you know, you can delve into the world of building these yourself if you're really handy. Um, but I'm going to connect up the Raspberry Pi and we'll see if we can go for a first setup. So bear with me a second while I plug in the display and a power supply for the screen. And then I think we're just missing one more connector, which is power for the Raspberry Pi. It's a little bit hard for me to show you that screen, but I will as it boots up. So this is going to take hopefully 30 or 60 seconds. And then uh, let me see if I can do it in my browser. And if, it, if I can, then I can screen share the process. Here's the awkward bit where you're watching a loading bar again while it boots. I'll bring the camera over if I can. How legible is that? Not too bad, actually. I think we can just about make out the text. So basically it says, uh, welcome to Volumio. Uh, web UI available at volumio.local 127.0.0.1. So effectively, it's, it's what you call a headless system. It doesn't need um, a screen or a keyboard or anything because you connect to it over the network. I did do a three minute setup before the call just to tell it my Wi Fi password so it connects to my own network, uh, which was a panic because I set it up two nights ago in a different house and forgot that the Wi-Fi password will change for a different house. Um, I've got that running. I'm now going to see if I can do the bit where you connect to it remotely. And of course, this might not work for us. It has not. So I'm going to do it from my phone, I'm afraid, and I'll hold up the screen. And hopefully my shiny phone screen won't, uh, won't be problematic. Mm, 
and not finding a connection, which is the issue we had earlier before the call is we connected and then it was missing. That's a shame because I was hoping to have a really cool moment where you um, get to, uh, you get the music coming out and suddenly everything comes to life and it's like a big victory, which when you're at a restart party, if someone fixes the sound system and it comes on, you get the whole room cheering. Um, so what I may do is, uh, I'll just check my notes and see if I missed anything critical, um, is I may actually wrap up for questions and we can do questions while I try and get this running so I can show off the process. So yeah, should we, should we carry on with some questions first? So I rebooted the Raspberry Pi. It immediately got a correct network IP address. And then I went to my laptop and went to volumio.local and it's immediately got a bunch of stuff, including web radio that's free and it works immediately. No setup needed whatsoever. You just click play and you've got radio. So how awesome is that? It only took about 10 minutes once it worked. Um, I had a quick question. So if somebody, if one of us were to set up a similar system to one you have, and then we have the same problem where we can't connect to the to the device through the browser, um, what are the kind of troubleshooting steps that you would go through? Uh, so I've just been through this because I had to do that <laughs> some days ago and I thought I'd solved it, but then I changed house. Um, so the first option is, I mean, I've got a tiny display, but you can plug that into a TV or a monitor and you can use keyboard and mouse, the USB computer keyboard and mouse. So the last line that I may have not read out is Volumio login. And you can log in um, on that screen with a generic password. The first time you set it up, it's got a generic password, which is for Volumio. And then you can say, here are my Wi-Fi settings. Um, what the process is the very first time you boot, which I couldn't do on the spot because it would involve dropping off of my home Wi-Fi and dropping off the call is you join Volumio is hosting its own Wi-Fi network too. And you can drop in there, connect to it and go through the setup. Um, there's also kind of more deep stuff where you can take out the SD card, put it in your computer and add the settings to the SD card. Um, typically these things are open source projects and um, lots of other people have tried it and got stuck. So there's online help. Uh, and also um, the makers tend to have put in guides. So it is almost a speed bump I find with any of these systems is getting up and running the first time is the hardest bit, which is why we've fallen at this hurdle. Um, it, it tends to be how it goes. Once it's up and running, it's lovely. Um, and it's a, a little bit um, of a cop out for me to say it was great. I used it all the time, but it was fantastic because being um, an open source project and being something that's kind of modern, you know, um, people are adding to it all the time. So I had a plugin to allow Spotify, which meant that I could find music on my phone, but send it to my little Volumio amp, which was, it was this whole setup except on my desk. So that it was, you know, embedded in my normal setup. Um, uh, but you can also um, tie it into, if you've got like a networked music library, I set that up. Uh, and I also set up the um, display to, it's a, it's a touch screen, so you can set it up to adjust the display to the kind of size of screen. Because the Raspberry Pi thinks it's got, you know, a full size screen, it shrinks everything. And then there's like, you know, you can say small screen mode and it, it zooms all the buttons out to look more like a home device than a computer. Um, but yeah, troubleshooting is typically read the manual, find the guide online, because it, it will cover the pitfalls typically. There's very often a, a plan B in the setup. I think Leila's suggesting that uh, <laughs> you can log off for a minute or two if you want to set it up and then yeah, back, I'm but, uh... trying to do it from my phone, which obviously isn't on the call, but um, it doesn't appear to be visible. And the thing is, I did get this working five minutes before the call. So I thought it was set up and I thought I could at least go through the same steps and it's not playing ball. And I don't know what to try next. Um, what happens when the dress rehearsal goes well, you know, the live performance just... <laughs> yeah, 
any tech demo is kind of bound to fail usually. Um, in fact, it's impressive that previous Skillshares have gone so well when, when I think back, because at work, anytime you try and live demo a new piece of work to anyone who isn't on your team, like a, a manager or someone in another team, you can guarantee there'll be a, a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, the solution then was, while it took a few minutes, it was quite straightforward. I just re-burned the SD card, so it thought it was a brand new installation, started again, because I think I got tangled up with the switching networks. Um, so I'm trying this. So I've got the, the app on my phone, the Volumio app. That's the nice thing is being a product with a kind of marketing team. They've built a phone app, so you can pair it and then you have a controller in your phone, but it plays out of a lovely real stereo. And it has a button for looking for devices, configure a new device. Is it wireless? Yes. Um, but I don't know how to connect to a preferred wireless network. So yeah, I'm not going to get anywhere, I think. I don't know why, which is really sad. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> Can always uh, film a video if you're doing it afterwards and we can... Uh... <laughs> That's true. Well, I was actually it later. screenshotting the stages because I knew it might not work. So in my phone, I've got the screenshots of the setup that I could probably put in some slides. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, in the meantime, then, does, does anyone have any kind of questions for Ben um, about anything that we've covered tonight or anything related to kind of audio gear in general? Um, feel free to turn your cameras and mics on if you want to ask a question yourself as well. Um, we've got some time just for a conversation if yeah, if that's what people would like. Um, if, if no one's got any immediate questions, I have a very, probably quite a very basic question. As someone who's relatively new to the world of audio gear, um, and forgive me if this is a stupid question, but uh, I've noticed with some 3.5 millimeter audio jacks, mm -hmm. um, they have like a little plastic band. So you've got yeah. kind of like three segments of like gold or silver metal depending i've always been curious why some seem to have two bands of plastic mm. and some three is there any real difference between the two or yeah yeah it's, it's a very specific difference and if i can pull a cable i can show you um so it's called a trs connector typically um tip ring sleeve uh and so the original ones which would have been the 1920s i want to say just had, um, if without the bands, you would have had like a big giant, it's called the sleeve, but yeah, uh, and that's your ground or your earth. So that's kind of your shield. And then a tip, which carried the signal. So like a lot of connectors, you've got kind of a prong that leads and then something else. It doesn't have to be audio. Um, when stereo became a thing, which was a bit later, I think stereo probably would have become popular in the 50s or 60s. The original vinyl records weren't stereo, for instance, until they solved some clever problems about how you get uh, two channels of audio out of one needle, which was a real conundrum. So the most fascinating days long Wikipedia article I ever read was how they figured out how to get stereo sound from a record needle. Um, so at some point they came up with stereo and to use this connector, they went, okay, well, why don't we say this is your primary side and then we'll add a ring, which is your secondary side. So I don't, don't know how much I can get it in focus, but at that point you had tip, ring, and then one whole sleeve. So that's called TRS. And that was left channel is considered your basic channel, which is usually the white one. So if I were to grab my lead, if I um, were to get a meter, multimeter and check for continuity, the tip here should come to the white side. And then the ring here will go to the red side's tip and both of the rings are just ground. The reason there's another band is because this is actually like a mobile phone adapter and you can have a microphone on it. Um, so that's why if you've got a headset that has a mic, you've got left, right, left, right, and a microphone. Um, beyond that, you kind of run out of space. So you can't really get many, but that's called tip ring ring sleeve, which is T-R-R-S. So the form factors are the same, they will always fit. And mostly there won't be a problem because um, the worst case scenario, if you plug in a headset with a microphone, to a socket that doesn't have a microphone input is you're gonna ground the microphone, which is safe. You're kind of like just limiting it from generating any signal it doesn't need to. Um, if I don't know how visible these are, but if you compare them, you can see that one of those is a tip ring sleeve and one is tip ring ring sleeve. So 
yeah, that was, that's very insightful because it's there's a very specific reason they do it. Um, and you might even observe in other systems they do the same that on audio. Thanks. That's actually really that's solved, solved that whole mystery for me yeah. without having to read the Wikipedia article. It might also explain if you've got an adapter somewhere in your system why your microphone stops working. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I've had a few headphones that have... Um... Ah, Leila asks why. Ah, because um, if you have, let's say you're on a laptop and you have a single socket that has um, an output for headphones and a microphone input in the same socket, which is common. Phones also tend to always have all of them in one. Um, but you use extension cable, for instance. Let's say you bought a new cable for your to make your headphones longer and the extension was only designed for audio, as in uh, output. It's only going to have the tip and the ring for the left and right channels. And because it doesn't have a separate ring for the microphone, it can't carry that signal all the way to the headset because it's almost like um, if you had lanes on a motorway, then you would have three lanes for left speaker, right speaker and microphone. You couldn't like make the microphone drive, you know, close out the lane and drive in the left channel for a while and drive back out. You basically shut off the ability to connect all the way down the cable. Does that make sense? Good. I'm, I tend to have a lot of very weird analogies, but I'm glad, I'm glad that I came across. <laughs> Perfect. So we've got a few minutes left. Um, are there any kind of last minute questions from anyone, again, about anything we've covered tonight or more general or broader questions or even more specific questions? Um, oh, one from Richard, uh, who says, I'm new to the Restart project and looking to reboot my interest in working with my Pi. Do you suggest useful help networks that I could turn to for help? Um, yeah, it's a tricky one because there's lots and lots of stuff everywhere on the cool things you can do with a Pi that are showing off. Like, I love YouTube because it can, it learns what you like and shows you more of it. Uh, so there's a, a bunch of cool projects, but they actually don't, I find they don't help me actually do it myself. I, I tend to be like, oh, look, you can do one of those things and one of those, and then I don't actually get hands-on. Um, getting hands-on, mostly I get, I go down kind of google or search engine rabbit holes where you open a forum typically mm -hmm. um the place the best places i find to find tech information is stack overflow which it has a lot of people writing code who are asking questions about coding but it also now has electronic stack overflow and there's even a mathematics stack overflow mm -hmm. and so you'll find people with raspberry pi projects um What's cool is you hope the, the ideal one is where you find someone who had your problem and then you find someone else who came and answered it and explained why. That's like the dream when you're searching, right? Um, Raspberry Pi has a great community on, I think, their own, I guess it's forums, but they have a great community of their own. And the other one, if you found an individual thing you want to do with a Raspberry Pi, um, you will often find Reddit will have a, a subreddit. Um, so, yeah, uh, I like forums, but I find that the best place of groups discussing stuff with a good ratio of kind of um real technical knowledge and integrity and not much arguing and at ego i find that t tends to be reddit and stack overflow people seem to be more interested in finding the truth and sharing it on those that's my personal preference and on on just to build on what ben said um oh there's a, a useful link from andreo in the chat um but Richard, you're also more than welcome to sign up to the Restarters Forum as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure there'll be some people there, like Ben, for example, who, who have some of this you know, in-depth knowledge and would be willing to help um, either with the subject knowledge itself or help you find a network where you can get that information. Um, I'll post a link in the chat too. Okay, cool. Any kind of last minute questions before we wrap up for the evening? Uh, Get them in now for a few seconds. Okay, well, great. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming along this evening. Um, I hope this has been really useful. Uh, and a huge thanks to Ben for um, preparing the session and doing all the kind of the prep in the background and trying to, <laughs> trying to tackle this Raspberry Pi. It's a shame it didn't work in the end. I'll but... probably get it working in five minutes and, uh, and then, yeah. <laughs> Best laid plans. <laughs> Um, but thanks so much, Ben. Um, it's really fascinating. And yeah, I certainly learned a huge amount. So 
Um, thanks, thanks for your time. Um, and thanks everyone else. Uh, in the meantime, have a great evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming. And, um, That's cool.